Are you ready for a great conference? Is this not a fantastic space to be having this conference in? So we're going to begin storytelling with a story. Six blindfolded experienced designers walk into a room. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard this one. Six blindfolded experienced designers walk into a room, and in the next room is an elephant. And we send the experienced designers in one at a time and say, you're blindfolded, but tell us what's in there. The first designer goes in and says, well, touches the skin and says, well, this is rough and scaly. Second one goes in, she says, well, this leg is like a column, it's like a building. The third one says, the ear, it's soft and floppy. The fourth one says, well, the tusk is smooth and hard. The fifth one says it has a nose like a snake, and the sixth one puts its hand between its legs and has a completely different description. Um, so everybody had the right answer. Everybody came out describing what they felt correctly to some degree, but nobody captured the essence of what that elephant was about. So today, as we begin this conference and talk about storytelling, I propose that the elephant in the room is the idea of story. We all call ourselves storytellers, but we don't stop and think about what does that really mean, and I think we use that term in a really fast and loose way. We have a lot of different parts of the elephant, context, backstory, situation, narrative, protagonist, but how do we really use those elements of story to create experiences? And how is storytelling and the creation of experiences possibly different than literature or theater or screenplays? You know, back in the early 90s, when I was a very young child, um, <laughs> the big buzzword at the time was interactivity. We still hear it a lot. Um, it sounded very sexy and exciting, and everybody talked about this is interactive. And I remember giving a talk at SIGGRAPH, and I said at the time I thought it was the most overused and incorrectly used term ever, because everything became interactive, whether it really was or not. Well, today, as over the last couple of years, I've really been thinking a lot about how do we use story when we design a ride or create an attraction? And I propose to you today that storytelling may now be the, the word we most constantly misuse or use carelessly, even though it's on many of our business cards. We say that's what we do. And this is a discussion, by the way, that's far more than just about semantics. To me, it's at the core of why some of the things we design work and why some of them fail. So today, we're going to deconstruct the notion of story and examine things and think a little bit about how it really works and what the true essence of storytelling in the creation of experience is all about. And we'll begin that journey into this world with our first speaker today. Our first speaker you could describe as a classic underachiever. Went to Harvard, got an MFA from USC Cinema School, been the lead singer in a rock band. He can draw, he writes code, he can direct actors, he can creative direct designers, he understands industry trends. For the past 20 years as CEO of Brainwave Thought Products Incorporated, he's written, designed, or provided creative direction for some amazing interactive and engaging theme park experiences around the globe, including a few you might have heard of, Turtle Talk with Crush, Monsters Incorporated Laugh Floor down in Orlando, The Stitch Encounter in the Disney Parks, the the award-winning Battle for Buccaneer Gold at Disney Quest, and just last year, what I thought was the really amazing the award-winning Enchanted Tales with Belle down at Walt Disney World. Um, we asked his good friend Joe Garlington, who you're going to get to listen to tomorrow speak, Joe's a legend in his own right by far, and to tell me a little bit about Raul that I could use in this introduction. He says, well, I'll give you something, but you can't say it in front of him because it'll embarrass him. But since he's not here and he's backstage and totally can't hear what I say, <laughs> um, Joe says that Raul is quite simply the smartest person he knows. So without embarrassing him, I can now bring him on stage and, and uh, welcome. Ralph Fernandez. Where's Joe? Joe? I can't see him. Um, wow, it's big. Are you ready to rock? <laughs> That's my question. All right. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Phil. Uh, I have a twin brother, and that's who he's describing. So hopefully I won't be the disappointment. Um, I don't know if you all read the program, let's see. 
Originally, this talk was called Orchestrating Desire, and the more I thought about it, that sounded like a lifetime movie about like an adulterous composer. <laughs> so I thought, maybe I should try to simplify that. Um, is this working? Let's see. Come on, fade. Ah, how sorry. That was the subtitle, which I thought made a little bit more, more sense. But really, I thought, what is this really about? And story, it's awesome. That's pretty much the boil down of it. Um, to give you just a little backstory on what he was talking about, originally Joe and I were going to do uh, this talk together. And he was going to do 20 minutes first, and then I was going to do 10 minutes and contradict everything he said. Um, unfortunately, now we've been separated, and he's in Adam's track. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> uh, so I had to figure out how to fill out the rest of this time that normally I wouldn't have to fill out. Uh, yay! Um, but fortunately, a lot of people ask me what I do. And it's hard to explain, so I actually have a little keynote that I carry on my iPhone, and I sit them down, and I show them that keynote. And so we're going to show you that keynote today. Um, so we're going to talk about story. And Phil, I guess, summarized really what we're talking about, which is it's, you, the word is used so many different ways that at least whenever I have a discussion about it with people, um, <laughs> you know where this is going. It's, and we're, we're in argument, I'm reminded of this. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Because um, I find everybody else is using it wrong. Uh, <laughs> so you can go download this from meme.com if you want. Um, so, well, what, is it, what does it mean? And part of the problem is that it has a meaning that normal people use, right? Which is what kids say, read me a story. It's a fiction, it's, you know, once upon a time, hopefully ends in a happy ending. But we use it differently inside the themed entertainment industry. And honestly, after 20 years of it, I'm not really sure what it means, OK? And so when faced in a situation where I totally don't know what something is, um, and I have to you know, give that answer, I do what I did in college, which is I find people who really know it really, really well get their answer and copy it. Um, <laughs> so. I uh, sent an email. Is this working? No. Hey, there you go. To Joe Lance Cicero. Joe is at uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. He is the portfolio lead for the uh, Hong Kong portfolio and for the ships. And I sent him an email which said, what does story mean in a themed entertainment context? And so this was his response, which is, I will read it, because I can't read it. Oh, it's bigger there. <laughs> story provides either the narrative or the subtext that guides your design choices. Knowing the who, what, and where helps to target the emotional core of the design. And I love this, because it's really, really tight, but I don't really think it gets to all the things that we think story is. So I also sent the same note, same email, to Scott Trowbridge, and this was his response. <laughs> I did not find that as helpful. <laughs> so I picked Kevin Rafferty, who is a great uh, writer at uh, Imagineering as well. And Kevin, he, you know, he has, this is what he does. And so he has some great, great quotes here. And I'm not going to read it through, because you can read it faster than I can say it. Um, but the thing you'll notice as you get to the end, or even within it, there's three or four definitions of story going on at the same time. It's the way you design things. It's what you design. It's really, really confusing. So after these responses and some others I got from other people, that's interesting. Hello, that's interesting. Um, I came to this realization. It's a terrible word, and we should never use it. <laughs> um, so we need other words to do that. And so I'm going to come up. Here's just some words that I think might help us with that concept. Absolute, nice. Um, <laughs> so here's what we have. We have backstory, theme, premise, promise, storyline, and plot. And I know that's a lot of things, seems a little complex, but don't worry. They do go together in a really clear way. <laughs> um, let's start with the backstory. And backstory, this is basically what Joe said. This is the who, what, where, when, why, and how that helps conjure the reality that our experience is set in. There's another way of thinking about it, and it's everything that happens before the guest arrives. Okay? It's really important. And if you do it really, really well, like they do in uh, Wizarding World of Harry Potter, it can be really cool just to be in the place. Now, the backstory here, in case you don't know, is basically everything in the movie from, that happened before Dumbledore died. 
and I hope I didn't ruin it for anybody. <laughs> um, by the way, Voldemort is Harry's father. Um, <laughs> takes us next to theme. Now, theme is the reality uh, that the elements are supposed to represent. Basically, if you boil down what happened in your, in your backstory, the physical realization of that comes out in your theme. And this is probably the easiest one for people to understand. So like the Matterhorn bobsleds, the theme is that it's the Matterhorn and you're riding bobsleds. <laughs> so that one should be pretty easy to remember. Now, that's the sort of physical consequence of your backstory. If you talk about what is the situational uh, consequence of your backstory, that's what's called premise. And so that's the summary of the current situation that acts as the entry point into the experience. Um, so it's actually, well, I'm actually going to just show you. So this is an example, Toy Story Mania. The one there is uh, Woody and Buzz has set up a carnival playset, and you're invited to play. Now, this is the one sentence of your backstory that your guests need to know. And it should be one sentence. And if you need like 27 sentences to explain to people what it is that you're doing, you've got to work it out because they're not gonna get it. So you wanna really get that premise. Some people call it concept. I think Phil might call it the situation, or that might be a TV character. Um, so that's your premise. Now your premise with your theme, they make a promise to your guest, okay? Which is basically what they're gonna experience when they go on your experience. Um, there's two kinds. Now the first one is called the explicit promise. And that, sometimes that's what's in the maps. Um, and that's great because people can read it and they can, you know, understand it. So, for example, here we have fly with Peter Pan in a magical ship, which is pretty accurate. Um, you have up there in Small World, take a boat tour around the globe, which is pretty good. Doesn't tell you about the song that won't die. But we set their expectations there. The problem is that there's an implicit promise. And it blows away whatever we write down, because sometimes they don't read the map. But also, they're bombarded by all sorts of other information about your attraction. So these are really the expectations that your premise and your theme set up in your guest, whether you want it to or not. And you're still on the hook for satisfying those expectations. And how do they get those expectations? Well, it's all these different things. It can be just the name of the attraction. It can be the logo. I mean, there's Eyes of the Yeti in there. I thought that was pretty subtle. Um, but it's also the, you know, your theming and these other promotional things. And it's really dangerous because you as a designer usually don't control any of this. Right? So like I went on Despicable Me, which is really, really fun. Except there it says Ride Now Open. It's a ride film. And I thought, oh, I did it again. Um, I thought it was going to be a ride. So th that's one of the dangerous things. So when you design your attraction, make sure you know what your promise is, what you think you're going to be fulfilling. Because you do have to deliver on that. And it's always going to expand when the marketing people get there. Um, so who read, the, who read the blurb in the book and noticed the, the line about cat videos? Okay, I can't see out there, so I don't know why I'm raising my hand. Um, who thought because it said there may be cat videos that there would be cat videos? OK. Now, I didn't promise it. I said may. <laughs> so this is the situation of implicit promise. I like to keep my promises because when you say something and you don't keep your word, it's not very nice. And so here's a cat video. So what does this have to do with the promise? And I don't know if you notice, before the little cat goes down the stairs, he checks in with the other cat. And the other cat's like, yeah, go. It's fine. So just don't be that cat. That's all I'm saying. If you don't make a promise you're not going to keep. Um, anyway, so once you've set up all those expectations, the only place that you're going to be able to fulfill those is in what I'm calling the storyline. You can also call it front story because it's opposite of back story because it's what happens after the guest starts the attraction. Okay? Um, and it's really important that that be a simple, simple, simple story. I'm using the word story. Ah, so I owe somebody five dollars. Um, how simple? To me, this is a really great simple story, and maybe you've seen this before, so don't ruin it for everyone else. Ah! 
Ah! Ah! I love that. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because it's really simple. And as it goes on, I don't know about you, I start to feel bad for the frog. Because he's like, he's trying to eat something, and this guy's being a jerk and saying, ah, I faked you out. And he gets payback. So a little bit of justice. So when you're doing your stories, it really should be that simple. Um, and the way to keep it simple is when you're looking at the events that you put in your, in your experience, really focus on things that matter. And by matter, I mean it creates some sort of emotional response or sets up an emotional response in your guest. Don't just put in extraneous events or actions or even bumps or jiggles that don't do that. Because what's going to happen is you're going to end up with something that we call plot. And plot is, well, the best summary of plot, I think, is from one of our great military minds, which is, it's a trap. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Um, it's the stuff that guests experience that doesn't matter, but you make them go through anyway. And it's essentially noise. And it also makes the rest of your storyline unclear. So I'd really, really suggest you try to keep it to a minimum. If you think about little kids when they recount their day, it's like, oh, we went to the park, and then we got an ice cream, and then, then I went to the merry-go-round, and then I got sick, and then I threw up, and then you don't, you're not interested anymore. So you really want to make it clear, and Phil actually pointed out um, that the, uh, one of the, some of the greatest storytellers of our age, um, sort of the modern Shakespeare's, they actually had a bit about this and then thing. It's the guys from South Park, um, and this is how they we found out this really simple rule that maybe you guys have all heard before, but it took us a long time to learn it. But we can take these beats, which are basically the beats of your outline, and if the words and then belong between those beats, you're f***ed, basically. You got, you got something pretty boring. What should happen between every beat that you've written down is either the word therefore or but. Right? So, so what I'm saying is that you come up with an idea and it's like, okay, this happens, right? And then this happens. No, no, no. It should be this happens and therefore this happens. But this happens, therefore this happens. Just yeah. like this happened and then this happened and this happened. That's not a movie, you know, that's not a story. Like Trey said, it's those, those two but because therefore that gives you the causation between each beat and that makes that, that's a story. So why that is, is because people want to make meaning out of everything they see. So if you put something in that really doesn't matter, they're going to try to assign something to that. And what that's going to do is just distract them from what you're trying to communicate in the first place. So really, keep it tight. And if you want, you can use that, that test, the sort of end-then test. And it's going to help you keep your story tighter. So let's just recap all of these things we talked about. Um, first, this is the backstory, And that's that, again, everything that happens before you get there, it helps conjure the world that you're in. And the physical result of that, that's going to be our theme. The situational result of that, that's going to be our premise. And by the way, this is not the order that you design in, just to be clear. This is just how the elements relate. So a lot of times people will start with premise or they'll start with theme. Or sometimes, when again, the premise and the, prom or the, premise and the theme come together and make that promise, sometimes you'll think, oh yeah, wouldn't it be great to do this? And that would be your promise. And then you work back to say what's a premise that sets that up, what's the appropriate theme for that. Um, but again, your, prem your promise has two different parts, the explicit one, which is the one you think you're asking people to do, and then the implicit one, which like, all the stuff that you design, you're actually creating that desire. Oh, that does relate to the title. Creating that desire in the guest. So be careful of those, because everything you do matters, and then you have to satisfy that in your, in your storyline. And just remember, no plot. Plot is bad. Um, so this is a little better than the original graph I showed, hopefully, but it's still pretty complex and it's a lot of work and as people in the business know, it costs a lot of money. So why do we bother doing it at all? And I'm going to propose three reasons for you. Um, because obviously you can make really fun attractions without any story. So these are the three reasons, at least for me, that I think are, uh, are the big ones as to why you'd want to go through the trouble to do this. First is broader appeal. Um, when I was a kid, I was, a, I was afraid of roller coasters. I had a dream where one chased me. It was terrible. Um, no, no, I wouldn't go on them. But then when Space Mountain came out, 
I was really excited because I always wanted to be an astronaut. And so I was there. I was totally on it. And since then, I would do roller coasters. And I don't know if you guys ever saw an original picture like this of when it first opened. They built it in black and white. Um, <laughs> but it's not just that story can take something that's fun and make it even more appealing. It can take something that's totally unappealing and actually make it fun. Like if I said, come on in, step right up, get in this big empty box, and I'm going to shake you for three and a half minutes, which is basically the attraction equivalent of this. Most people would not get in line for that. I know, you would, I see that, okay, that's great. Um, but if you add an interesting world with that backstory or a premise that, that sounds really awesome, you end up with Star Tours, which, again, game-changing theme park classic. Uh, so that's actually one of the coolest things. It's like a superpower that story has, which is that peop it makes people believe they're doing things that they're not. So much so that you can let people do things that they always wanted to do, but they never could because physically impossible. And that gets you to the second thing that themed entertainment does great for people, which is wish fulfillment. Stefan and I were talking about this last night. It's, it's pretty much what a lot of us are in the business of doing. Um, so if you think about, well, what are the things people want to do, those are the guides for you when you think about what kinds of attractions you want to make. Because those are pre-existing desires, and it's way easier to design something to a pre-existing desire. So if you say, oh, I always wanted to fly or go to Mars or be the you know, ride the space shuttle, you can do these things. You can actually go to Kennedy Space Center, and they have this launch, shuttle launch experience. And you're actually where the astronauts were. So it's really cool, and I can feel like I'm an astronaut. And it's that level of immersion that really makes people feel like they're doing it. They're getting to live that dream. Now, immersion, I don't, I don't remember if Phil said that in his setup, is another one of those words. What do we mean by immersion? And I'm going to propose this as your answer. It's how much you believe you're doing what you're only pretending to do. And that's different than realism, OK? So when I go, oh, man, I want to be an astronaut, I don't think, oh, yeah, I can't wait to learn to pee in a diaper again. You know? That's not my dream of an astronaut. And they do. It's frightening. Um, it's really about what the fantasy is. And so our job is to fulfill on that fantasy. Even if it's not realistic, the more we fulfill on that fantasy, the more immersive and the more people are going to feel like that they're living that out. So if you're familiar with Pirates of the Caribbean, one of the great themed attractions, it's one of my favorites, people feel, and it's beautiful, people feel less like pirates on that than they do on the electronic version that is at Disney Quest. And that's because at Disney Quest, you get to steer a ship and shoot cannons and actually sink, sink them and take their treasure. You're doing the things that a pirate gets to do. And so you really feel like you're a pirate, even though the graphics aren't even as good as what's on my iPhone. And I have an old iPhone. Um, but why is that? Because they're not really doing any of those things. They're pulling a string and looking at a screen, right? So what makes it work? And it's the same things as we talked about before. It's the story layer. Now, Joe somewhere out there is grinding his teeth, because this is where we argue, that story and interactivity aren't in conflict. Um, we're using these same things. We created a world. We themed you know, input controllers as a helm and as a, a ship. It's all the same stuff. The only part that's actually in conflict is this part, the plot. Because people think they confuse plot for story. The events that matter in Interactive are the events you create yourself. It's not a bunch of other cinema scenes that you watch. So if you look even at these attractions, this is the Donkey Attraction, uh, Donkey Live, Monsters, Turtle Talk. These three attractions, they're all basically the same thing Te from a technical standpoint, same as these three. Same technology, same basic mechanic. It's the story layer that makes them different, unique experiences and what actually lets them fulfill different desires for the guests. Because somebody wants to talk to Crush, they love Crush. They're totally satisfied by Crush, but they're not going to be by monsters, although they might like monsters. So it's really the story layer that gives these meaning and makes these things fulfill their wishes. And that's going to bring us to the third thing that I think is actually the coolest thing about it, which is its deeper range of emotions. So if you're on thrill rides, the, the range of sort of experience is sort of surprise and ah, to ah, it's, it's all A sounds. Um, <laughs> some reason, I get ooh, you get ooh sometimes. Um, 
But here, you can actually get comedy, or you can get this feeling if you're doing magic quests, you can feel like you're this empowered wizard, or you can get a, a tender moment with crush, or you feel like you're a hero. These are feelings you don't necessarily get when you're just doing an unthemed thing, and that's because guests are bringing their own expectations, their own symbolic meaning to what they're doing. That's what you get to leverage. And that's not just true in, in these kinds of attractions, it's also true in our character experiences. Now characters, you'd think, well, they're right in the story, because they come out of the story. Well, most of the time what happens, we take a performer, we put them in a costume, and we get them, give them some themed language, and we throw them outside, and then people sign up and ask for photos and books. There's not any shared experience, because the character lives in one world, and the guest lives in another one. So when they try to talk, I went on Space Mountain, you know, and I did this thing or whatever. What is Belle going to say? Oh, I love Space Mountain. That's my favorite. <laughs> there is no such thing. <laughs> really, Star Tours is better. I love the Hoth sequence. You know, it doesn't, they don't live together. And that's why you see things like this where they're not even, they're not looking at each other. They, she's been in line for 20 minutes to get that signature, and she's not looking. The other, uh, or you end up with this situation where somebody hands Belle a Perry the Platypus, and she, she's like, what is this? Is it a hat? You know, and it ends up on the internet. And <laughs> I know this person. She was rather embarrassed by this. So instead of this, if you end up going, you say, you put them in a shared story context. Instead of having this sort of situation, you can end up with this situation. This is from Enchanted Tales with Belle, where people go inside the story of Belle, and they actually act out a story with her. And what that lets them do, that shared story context means that they now have a way to relate to each other. And so you get a much broader range of emotions and excitement. This kid on the lower right, just, it's crazy. And it's not just the kids. Pretty much, almost every show, and this is weird, almost every show I go to, there's some adult in the audience who's tearing up by the end of this. Sometimes it's me. Um, but <laughs> that's how I get the numbers. Um, but it, <laughs> <laughs> um, But really, what it boils down to, because they're sharing they're actually sharing a moment, those, mem those moments, those experiences are more memorable and more meaningful, which really gets to what I think is the core of story and the kind of story that really, really matters, probably the one that matters the most, and that's the guest story. Now, you guys probably know this. Research shows that people's brains are sort of hardwired to remember things as stories, and so they're doing this every day with the experiences that they live. They're creating stories of their lives. And how they describe those experiences gives you a little window into how they relate to them or how they feel about them. So if you say, what did you do last night? Somebody goes, oh, they, oh yeah, I was flying out in space with this dude bro and this girl who's like green skin. No, they tell you I went and saw Guardians of the Galaxy. It's just a movie. And so same thing happens with a lot of attraction. You say, oh yeah, I went on Harry Potter or I went on, on uh, Star Tours or whatever. But when kids talk or go to see Crush, they come out and they say, I talked to Crush. It was real for them. And so I think as we're designing experiences, I think one of the most important things is to keep in mind how the guests are going to make their own stories out of the stories that we're telling. Because you know, as people grow up and they get older, a lot of the stories, they're going to be lost. They're going to be forgotten. And only the most important and meaningful ones are going to be the ones that stick with them. And probably most of what we do, that's not going to make the cut. Let's be fair. But uh, just recently, we opened a talking uh, Mickey meet and greet in Florida. And there was an older gentleman, about 80, in his 80s, and he had his grandson with him. And his grandson's talking. And the, old, the older guy, he was, he was crying. And so the cast member asked and said, why are you crying? And he said, all my life, I dreamed of being able to talk with Mickey Mouse. And here, my grandson is living that. I think that's the kind of things that we can get to when we do our jobs right. And that's really why story, I think, is awesome. <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, that's the end. Yes, it worked. So if anyone has any questions, oh, thank you.
No questions. Why, why did Joe abandon me? That's a good one. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, I, was, I was wondering how important is it for a guest who doesn't necessarily want to experience an attraction to know what the story from start to end of that attraction is? OK, so first we said we never use the word story again. So oh, which I'm sorry. part? I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Which part of the story do you mean? Okay. okay, that's right, yeah. Okay. Uh, you, go, you go to the Little Mermaid ride, and you see like this beautiful facade, and you see, oh, it's under the sea, Journey of the Little Mermaid. So, I mean, generally, like, I guess just from the name, you get the idea, but like, is it, is it important that the, like, say the parents would say, oh, have fun on the ride, kids? Is it important for them, even though they're not experiencing the attraction, to know what the word that must not be named is? <laughs> Or the, the I'm sorry, OK, let me see if I can. First, I want to say something. I'm glad you asked this. Never build another Omnimover ride again. <laughs> I know there's a temptation. No, this is true. Um, and then I'll try to answer your That's question if I understand it. Um, there you go. We did it for capacity reasons. And there's actually one, I think there's probably a couple. If you can't beat Haunted Mansion, don't do it. That's just bottom line. I'm sorry if you're who's in the middle of making an Omnimover attraction. Uh, <laughs> It's important that they know the story. I think if things should stand on their own. Okay? And again, dark rides are probably the hardest thing to do nowadays. Uh, and so anybody who's willing to take on that challenge, I, I salute them and ask them why they're crazy. But that ride, I think, specifically is about re reliving moments from the movie that you love. If you haven't seen it, then it's a beautiful spectacle and there's some nice songs. So I think in that case, is it important? I don't know that anybody has a bad experience because they don't know the movie. And I don't know that they have a great experience because they know the movie. I think it's a pleasant enough ride. Does that answer it? I'm sorry. Uh, I, was just, I was just using the Little Mermaid ride as an example. As an example, of course. Okay, so like the story, so like the story behind the story behind um, Rock and Roller Coaster, where it's like, hey, you're going to an Aerosmith, you're going to an Aerosmith concert, and you're running late, and you're hopping on the lim the super fast limo. Yeah. So my again, my personal feeling is that's a lot of work to get me on a roller coaster, right? Now, for some people, they may feel like they're really with Aerosmith, but I think there's a bit of a challenge there because if you're there for Aerosmith, you see a video, and then you're not with them, then you're riding a roller coaster, so. Is it important to know? I think what happens is you end, up, you end up making your bed as a designer. And then some people are going to say, oh, I wanted more Aerosmith. Or some people could say, I don't know why I'm waiting through this. I just want to ride a roller coaster. So the it gets back to that clarity of the premise that you're setting up and understanding the promise that you're making to people. So to that degree, I think it's important that people know what you're setting up. But beyond that, all those beats in the story, most of it washes over, it seems, at least in my experience. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? I'll try to be better. <laughs> You're supposed to give me your questions ahead of time, so I could just. <laughs> hi. Yeah, hi. Could you give an example of um, an attraction that uses plot instead of story? Almost every film ride. <laughs> now, I. I wanted to be nice. Um, so I, took, I, I had some examples of things where I felt that, at least for my personal standards, I wouldn't do. And I'll tell you honestly, I love the original Star Tours, and friends of mine worked on the newer Star Tours, and I don't think it works as well. Um, and that's because those scenes don't mean anything. Like if you go to Hoth versus you go to Coruscant versus you go whatever, none of it matters. You know, it's a different movement, and so maybe if you love Hoth, great. All right, I get to be at Hoth, but it doesn't add up to anything. And Phil might disagree with me on this a little bit, but and I have to obey him because he's tall. Um, <laughs> I feel that one of you know sometimes you make a great attraction and people take the totally wrong lessons, and I think that Star Tours was one of those things that it said, all right, motion simulator rides. That's what it's all about, and that's what's really cool. What at least made it work for me. When I first wrote it, yeah, I was what I think one. No, I 
was older than that, um, was when you get to the end and you get to go in the trench, and this is the movement, and I know it from my childhood, you get to fly and you feel like you're Luke Skywalker. What made that be an awesome attraction is you got to do something you always wanted to do. You wanted to be Luke Skywalker and you wanted to blow up the Death Star. It wasn't that you were put in a paint can and shaken for three minutes. So what happens now when people make these rides is they think of excuses to, want to shake people or come up with motion or things like that, rather than thinking what is something somebody already wants to do and part finding a way to fulfill it. So I think, again, apologies to all the people in Imagineering who now will never call me. Um, <laughs> there isn't that in the new one. It's events that don't really matter. And so that's one of those examples. And so if you're going to do a film ride, especially because it's tempting, because it's about motion and all those things, try to have it have some emotional meaning beyond just shaking people. I think you're going to do better. Anyone else? Here, there, there's one up here. One in the back. Yeah, as the, as the gentleman pointed out with the story with the elephant, life is basically based on the perspective of where you see it from. Yep. Uh, from my understanding, basically plot is mm -hmm. the action which drives the story, which is the emotional journey of the protagonist. So basically all the plot line does is create opportunities to drive the emotional story. So to me, story is the emotion of the deal. It's that simple. It's, you know, I, um, when I went to USC, my screenwriting teacher, a guy named Paul Lucy, he wrote a book called Story Structure, buy it, it's really great. Um, he used it, and in, in, it biases my use of the term. He said story is what the character wants to happen and plot is what the author wants to happen. So that's sort of my bias on it, and I agree with you. And again, this is, people define words the way that makes sense to them. That was the way that he broke it down. So yes, story is really about the emotional journey that you take. If there's something that isn't on that emotional journey, why are you putting it in? And so that's why he, called, that's why he separated plot out. So yeah, if you want to say just an enumeration of events and call plot that, it's totally accurate in that context. I think what happens is by not putting a big sign saying don't do this on people, people get into that sequence of oh and this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens without worrying about the causal effect or the emotional effect. So that's why I break it down that way. But yours is completely valid too. Come over here. How you doing? Uh, Daniel Gomez, uh, first person Hi. experience. And I was uh, the instructor at the Special Warfare Center School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Awesome. So my question is, um, when you talk about immersion, you mm -hmm. said immersion not equal reality. Yes. Um, one of the things we try to do in training is to do both of those. Mm -hmm. Get them fully immersed without actually shooting them, you know, um, to provide that realism. <laughs> so, so, our, so what I was going to ask is, like, the why. Why did you say that does not equal realism? Because, well, I'll give you an actual example. So when we were doing um, the... Pirates Buck and Battle for Buccaneer Gold. Our cannons, they look sort of like cannons, but you pull a string to shoot them, which is not really that realistic. And you pull it over and over and you can shoot as much as we want. We actually play tested, and Joe will remember this, we play tested different ways of firing the cannon, taking a little lit stick like you're lighting it, and actually explored this idea of having to reload them. And nobody liked it. It wasn't fun. It didn't make them feel more like they were pirates. They just thought it was irritating. Okay? And part of that is because they're not really doing it. Okay? So when you're really doing it, there's prices you have to pay because it's reality and you have to do it that way. But when you're in this situation, they want to be sinking ships and taking treasure, sinking ships and taking treasure. They don't want to go, you know what, nine months you're on the boat and you don't do anything. <laughs> uh, it's realistic, guys. Just hold on. I have a tattoo here that looks like a watch. No. Um, so that's the thing. Now, your situation is really different because you're trying to, to train people, at least in, inferring, um, to build stuff in that's not at all conscious, that's all just reaction at some point. That's be, and so you want to make it as similar to the experience they're going to be in as possible so that they don't learn something wrong, right, that'll get them killed. Here, we're just trying to keep people entertaining, and if you stop, again, willing sus suspension of disbelief, 
The willingness part comes from the treat you're putting on the other side. So the less of a treat you put there, the less willing they're going to be. And that's why, at least in our business, it's about making, giving them the fantasy, not about going, well, you know what? You want to be an astronaut? You're training for nine months. You're going to throw up a lot. It's really great. <laughs> thank you. Anyway, oh, thank you. Anyone else? A couple in the back? Oh. I went over here. Can you give an example of how the pre-show and queue line have worked to drive the story forward in the uh, but this happened, therefore this happened manner? Oh, what's a good one? Um, it's interesting when thinking what do you call the pre-show? Um, because to me, the best example of a pre-show is the Haunted Mansion stretch room. Now, some of you are going to say, but that's not the pre-show. That's part of the show. But you don't get on the ride vehicle until later. So in my mind, the best pre-show is one that you don't perceive as a pre-show at all. It takes you from, I was in a theme park, and whatever land I'm in, and you know, where, where should we go next, and did I get my churro, to being in the world. Um, so there, you know, when hinges creak on doorless chambers, I think that's one of the best ones because it just sets the tone. It's just audio, so really cheap. And then they take you to this fantastic room that, oh my god, it, it, it defies the laws of physics. It blows your mind. How many people have seen an Enchanted Tales with Belle? Woo, all right. Um, the special effects guys came up with that mirror. You remember the mirror? Which is incredible. Um, and it wasn't originally part of the design. You know, we've come, come up with all this other stuff, and, and then they came up with this great idea. And it totally blows people's minds. And part of that is once you do that at the beginning, then they're open to everything that comes after it. So I think even though it's not setting a lot of plot with the end then and then and then, it gives you enough to say, oh, we got this mirror that can take us to any time, we, you know, show us any time we want. Oh, and the time we want to go to is when Belle met the beast when they fell in love. That one sentence, that's the and then part that matters to get you from here to there. So I think that's another example of that. Um, other pre-shows, none are sort of striking me offhand. But if you have an example, I can talk about that one. Is that, is that enough? That, yes. And video pre-shows, I think, a lot of times will fall into that, too. I think what happens is when you start making videos, people fall into this habit of, oh, it's cinema, oh, it's television, and they, they go into this other set of ways of thinking. And so I, I prefer not doing that, if possible. Um, hello. I know at the start you mentioned um, that you talked a lot about roller coasters and how, like, specifically there's a lot of, it's mainly just like a, um, the range of motions tends to be smaller than those in dark rides. And I was just wondering if you could range talk Range of emotions, yes, yes. Yes, range uh -huh. of emotions. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what you thought about story and coasters, because I know not necessarily a lot of parks you know, build these big steel giant monsters, but then you've also got parks that have attractions like 13 for Bolton, Revenge of the Mummy, that really mm -hmm. take coasters and use them as a vehicle for an experience. And right, so Gringotts is Yeah, or the... Gringotts, exactly. Um, I have not ridden it yet. I'm so sad because I want to see it. There, the coaster is just, is not, it's not a coaster. It, to me, it's back to sort of, it just becomes the vehicle to tell the story, and it happens to be a roller coaster. And so I think if you do it right, it's great. Um, so in that, and that's the difference, because they've added the story layer. I guess, I guess the difference is when you're not theming it, roller coaster is, a, is just a roller coaster. It says to you, look, I'm a roller coaster, and it's there. Gringotts doesn't say. Hi, I'm a roller coaster. It says, go to Gringotts, right? So it's that story layer that's making it have that wider range of motions, and mainly because you bring your own expectations and your own meaning to the stuff. Um, if you didn't know Harry Potter, it probably wouldn't be as fun story-wise, but you'd still enjoy the movement. So, but again, I think that, that comes from the story layer. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? I got a comment. Hi. Um, Hi. I was wondering if you thought Splash Mountain would be an example of a kind of traditional story that worked or not. I, I really like Splash Mountain. Um, part of it is because 
it, the exterior design lets you see the splash first. So I think if somebody went on that ride, if they'd hidden that, I think it would not satisfy guest expectations. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if it didn't say Splash Mountain, if it was just called Zippity Doo Dah. And I think that would be, we should try that as a test, see what happens. <laughs> um, so, Mom. Um, uh, so I think it works pretty well there in terms of really making you feel like you're in that world. And again, I wouldn't like go on a flume ride in general, but that one I really enjoy. And I think the laughing place is a, a great way to get you over the hill. One thing just about Splash Mountain, and I don't know if you guys use the internet, it's really interesting. Um, there are so many photos of people, and I don't mean the obscene ones, People doing stuff for the Splash Mountain photos. There's one where people are like playing chess, which I think is a taken from an XKCD thing, or Jenga. And these are in the photos. And so they go on the ride just so they can get this photo of themselves doing something really odd at the end. And to me, that's really cool because that's that thing about guests making their own stories out of what we're doing. You know, so now, oh yeah, we went, remember that time when we did this? And that's going to be one of those memories that lasts a little bit longer because it, it gives them a way to make their own story out of it. So. Hi, you mentioned that uh, simplifying the storyline is super important for yes. making a ride, um, I guess, as succinct as it can be. Um, do you have any suggestions on how, or strategies on how to make a storyline that you think is too complicated a little simpler? Um, I do think the and then thing is pretty good. Um, interestingly enough, I didn't, hadn't seen that clip when it came up. It's just something that I noticed listening to my nieces. Um, no. I think, go back to this Paul Lucy. I thought he was a great teacher, and he may still be teaching at the USA, I don't know. Um, he describes story as a dramatic summary of an event. And so what he's saying there, and I think it's true here too, is that you're really trying to just do the setup for whatever your climax is. Right? It's like a joke that there's, you know, even though you tell it's a setup and a punchline, it's really one thing. It's just spread out in time. So if you look at your ending, I would say start with your ending, start with what your point is, and then figure out what you need to say to make that ending have impact when you get there. And if it doesn't fall along those lines, just cut it out. You know, it's also easy to look at if you have characters, if you're doing something that's not necessarily our kind of story, but if you're doing a uh, more traditional cinematic story. Just look at your characters, and if they're in the same emotional space at the beginning of the scene and the end of the scene, you don't need the scene. Take the scene out, they can refer to it. Oh, I went to the doctor today, great. But if that change of emotions, those are the times that you want to actually dramatize and play out in real time. And I think the same thing here, if you're on an attraction, those moments which are going to go from scary to happy or happy to scary, those are the parts you want to include and to just bring it back, that's why I think Omnimovers are a bad idea. Because you can't reset the scenes. So that means that the scene that you're in has to have the same emotional feel at the beginning and at the end of the scene. The stretch room is great. I mean, you couldn't do a stretch room in an Omnimover, right? And a lot of the old story, the old dark rides were not Omnimover for the same reasons. So you could actually have an, a moment where the emotion changes through the scene. So really, to me, look at what you're describing and see if there's any change emotionally for the guest or the character. If it's not, cut it. And then if you can reasonably use the word and then and can't find a way to say, oh, this happened so he did that, then same thing, just take it out. And you're going to lose stuff you love. But my feeling is the, the gauge of quality of what you create is by the best thing that you took out. That sort of lets you know how good your thing is. Uh, you mentioned um, that people, some people might not get as much out of the Harry Potter experience if they weren't familiar with the story, mm -hmm. the three people that aren't familiar with the story. But um, it made me think that there are some places that, that, that people visit where they're generally familiar with the stories. You know, yeah. Most people going to Disney, you know, you, you know something about Cinderella or Belle or something like that when you arrive. But there are other places where they're not necessarily familiar with the story that's being told. And I would just, mm -hmm. uh, just made me think, do you, do you have any comments on, on how one might approach a situation differently if, if you think that the, that the guest may not be as familiar with, with the story? I think it's best if you design presuming people know nothing. Um, Joe likes to say when, you, when people walk into the parks that they're 
their IQ drops about 10 points. And it's just because they're so overwhelmed by stuff. So I think things always have to work on a level where you don't have all that set up. And if you need some little piece of setup, I think you get one sentence, maybe two. And that that should be presented, if you have to, in some sort of pre-show that's you know, told in media, or it's in the guidebook, or you just notice it as you go through the space. I think that's really, oh, one more question. Um, I think that's really the issue. So it's good to design on multiple levels. And I know we try to do that on like Crush. There's, jo there's stuff for kids, and there's stuff for adults, if, even though we're answering the kids. And I think the same thing would happen, is you want to design the experience saying, if th somebody knows nothing, how are they going to feel about it? And then if they know it, it should be even better. That's pretty much all. I can, we can do one more, Phil says. I must obey Phil. Uh, do, you, do you think that there's room in today's world to design attractions, over here, Aha. To, to design attractions that are telling new stories? In other words, they're not attached to existing IPs or movies or anything like that. Um, where the backstory is provided on the spot, you don't have to have any existing knowledge of, of what, what you're about to experience? I hope so. <laughs> I think the answer can be yes, um, but I think you're going to want to tie into archetypes as much as possible, and again, the existing desires or genres that people have. I'm trying to think, who, anyone here watch Doctor Who? It's a British show. <laughs> One of the things, especially in the earlier, the some of the Christopher Eccleston ones, but even the early David Tennant ones, not, and it's not that it's not true for the later ones, is somehow they were able, in like the first minute and a half that you met a character, you really cared about them. And these are people who are probably going to die. You know, it was one of these things like, oh no, I really like them, they're dead. Um, and they do it in minutes. So I think there is a way to do that. I think part of it is making sure that the rest of the context is really, really well understood so that you have enough space in people's brains for that one new element to drop in. So I think, again, I hope people will do it. It's always a risk. You know, marketing wants to put that poster up with all the characters that you know. But I do think, again, I think that there's room for it, and I think people will be better for it, and then the, the man's coming for me. <laughs> thank you. Anyway, thank you guys so much. Months and months of planning and the cat video is what you're going to take home from that. Probably. <laughs>